here. That was my New Year's resolution this year is always start the recording before you start the room. <laughs> so if I go wrong, uh, somebody yell at me, please. <laughs> so I've come to realize this week that I was meant to be rich based on the amount of money that I spend. <laughs> Anybody have that feeling? Yep. <laughs> Hey, our co-host, Melanie, where are you at there? I'm here. Oh, there you are. Okay. And how are you doing tonight? I'm doing pretty well. How about yourself? Um, I'm doing good. I'm, getting <laughs> ready. Hey, I'm trying to get the lawnmower ready to go to cut that grass in about another month. And Oh, boy. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm ready to hit the field sort of thing. I got to tell you what I did the other night. It was an okay. accident. It really was. My wife and I were sitting on the sofa together, and she asked me, will you pass me the lipstick? And instead, I accidentally grabbed the, the glue stick. Oh, boy. Now she can't talk to me. Oh. <laughs> oh, I, that, that, yeah, that was terrible. That's <laughs> Friday, I, I made a decision. Friday, I am leaving. I'm going to travel the world until I run out of money. I'll, I'll be home Saturday afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> so, all that. Oh, I got to tell you, what a what a weekend. Uh, some of you people that know me uh, well know that uh, the Daytona 500 weekend is a national holiday for me. And boy, it was it was really uh, messed up this week. This weekend with the had rain uh, Saturday and Sunday, and one of the races that was going to be held Saturday, they decided that they're going to run that late Friday night before the rain came in, which worked out well, by the way. But around here, lights lights out here at the house are about you know eleven thirty to eleven thirty to midnight. And this this race I was watching on TV went until 1.40 a.m. And uh, our cat was even messed up. She came out like twice out the hallway, meowed at me like, aren't you coming to bed yet? Yeah, even she was confused. But, uh, man, if you follow NASCAR, you know that we had, we had two races yesterday. We had the Daytona 500 yesterday and then had another race last night that was over at midnight. So yeah, I, my weekend kind of got really messed messed up. So anyway, um oh by the way, I wanna I wanna also uh, give everybody an advisory. Don't throw false teeth at your vehicle. You might denture it. That's a groaner. Uh oh. I see Mel has a dog down here. There's, there's her, there's her lovely. I told you guys that I would try to bring her on sometime. Wow. This is Mabel. She's gotten big. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Mabel. Oh yeah, look at that. I suppose. <laughs> okay. Good name for a dog. <laughs> Yeah, maple syrup. Oh no, that's maple syrup. Okay. Ah, that's later. Don't give my my slide away, Jerry. That's true. That's right. I sorry. I sorry. I took away took your uh, hot spot away. Okay, let's get started here with the intro. We got a lot of people waiting to hear Mister Herman here tonight. So, uh... okay. So the Zoom Rock Room always presented first and third Tuesdays of each month. If you're our our guest tonight, you want to you want to join in, you can just simply email us your email address, and uh, you'll be like you put on the be on a permanent uh, pass. You'll get an invite for each program that we do. Usually the first and third Tuesday at this time, unless. Uh, we need to take a Tuesday off for one reason or another, but uh, 
it's a fun time as you will see and uh you'll see our program lineup come up here momentarily and the zoom rock room is uh, always sponsored by lair architect in lake havasu city i always uh, people ask me how in the world did you get hooked up with somebody in arizona uh, actually paul is my cousin and of course his wife marcella so uh, Paul is busy in Lake Havasu City and uh, designing for the future. Email them at layerarchitect at yahoo.com. And I'm happy to announce that they've signed uh, a contract to continue the sponsorship through uh, 2024 into 2025. So uh, although the, the Zoom rate is going up, folks, believe it or not, but uh, they're going to stay with it. So we appreciate Again, their support for making this happen that we don't have to charge a membership fee. Uh, so go ahead, Mel. All righty. As always, uh, the Dirt Man Report. Uh, you can go to extremecody.com. Um, he always, uh, Andrew makes the best videos. They're always funny, educational. Um, you always learn something new and they're always very entertaining. So go on. Um, YouTube, if you have missed any of those episodes or want to re rewatch any uh, that you thought were interesting. Um, and when he has new ones, he shares them with us here on the Zoom room. So they're always aired here first. So you guys get the sneak peek. No video tonight, but uh, I'm sure he'll be coming up with something here. Andrew is in the room tonight. Hello, Andrew. And thanks for everything that you do. I know you're a busy guy with everything you got on your plate. Uh, speaking of which, uh, Central Pennsylvania Rock and Mineral Club is presenting their annual Rocks for Kids Junior Education Day in actually just a little less than two weeks on March the 2nd. So if you have any children, grandchildren, you want to bring out to the Linglestown Life United Methodist Church in Linglestown. Uh, I believe registration is five hours uh, a child. And it's a, a program where you uh, rotate uh, around to different stations. Um, I and Valerie will be there to do uh, minerals and toothpaste uh, at our station. It's really a great day. They have uh, 110, 120 uh, kids come out for that day's activities. That's a great, great educational tool to get uh, families and kids into the rock hounding sport. So register now at rockandmineral.org and uh, show up March the 2nd. It will be a great day. Um, the Institute in Waynesboro, we support them. Uh, they are still in the midst of a capital campaign right now. I have to find out when that's going to be coming to an end, but uh, they are making progress moving into their new property and they are going to be announcing their new name they're going to change their name from the institute to something else i'm not allowed to tell you what that is but we hope to have their executive uh director tracy with us to make that big announcement on one of our upcoming uh, zoom rock rooms so if you have a couple of uh, quarters sitting in the corner um uh, go to nature and culture institute.org and give to their capital campaign uh, to make all this uh, this new property uh, spectacular. Um, while I'm on that topic with the Institute, my annual lecture uh, that I do uh, for them every usually every May is going to be the rise and fall of the Appalachian Mountains. Uh, that's going to be held at the Church of the Apostles in Waynesboro. Good news, it's free. So come out May 2nd at 7 p.m. and uh, learn about how the Appalachians were formed and how they got eroded down and all what's found within the Appalachians. Uh, be a fun time because we're priming you for the bus trip that's coming up uh, about a week and a few days later on May the 11th called The Crystals, Creatures, and Caverns. And myself and... Steve Lindbergh from the uh, that we most of, of us know from the University of Pittsburgh Johnstown is going to be our uh, he and I will be hosting the bus trip 
to the new Paris Quarry and to Coral Caverns, all within the Bedford, Pennsylvania region. And I did have a phone call from the Institute on Friday. They're warning me, if you want to sign up for the bus trip, you got to do it because they're about that close from being filled up. So uh, they still have some people, a few people that haven't paid. But if you uh, get in there and register and pay, you're going to take priority over them. So um, we tried to get a bigger bus. That's Hi. not going to happen. Uh, so uh, what we Hi. have to deal with with the bus is what we have. And like I said, once it's full, it's full. So um, go to nature and culture institute dot org and uh, and find you know and find the website to register right online. Uh, one more announcement for me is uh, I think I promised to you this last time, but we finally have reached the agreement and the arrangements, uh, cooperation with the York County Northern Historical Society, Historical and Preservation Society, York County History Center. We're going to do a Youth Archaeology Week this summer in uh, the Dillsburg area, June 17th to the 22nd. Uh, this is for middle school age, grades eight to six to eight. So if you have, again, children, grandchildren in the Dillsburg, uh, York County area, or even Cumberland County, um, uh, there's, it's going to be a great opportunity to learn how to do archaeology. And this is going to be a very uh, good site that we're going to be uh, excavating at with uh, the homestead of a very famous... Uh, industrialist uh, person that lived in Dillsburg. The landowner has already been finding a lot of artifacts just on their own. So anyway, uh, uh, register for that. Also, we're looking for adult help. If you want to come to uh, the Dillsburg area one day or all five days or three days, uh, let me know. You are required to have your clearances, which is the state child abuse clearance and the state Pennsylvania state uh, police criminal background check completed before that week starts. So uh, we are looking also for adult help. All right, Mel. All righty. Red line telescopes uh, with Ray Wade Kraut. Uh, you can call them uh, using the number there, or you can email them using that email address to schedule a time to either view, touch, demonstrate any of the telescopes that they have in stock if you are interested in or are in the market for a telescope currently. Uh, they are, again, located in a Red Lion PA. The address is also listed. Um, and they supply all of their telescopes for any customers in York, Lancaster, Harrisburg, and all the surrounding areas. They do offer free in-home delivery and setup. So, like I said, if you are in the market, feel free to give them a uh, a shout out. Give them, a, look them up, and try to talk to them. Our upcoming schedule looks like this. Um, starting in March, already in just the two weeks. Uh, March the 5th, uh, Mr. Dean Rookio is going to be back. He was with you in November. Did a uh, program about, the, I think, Devonian... Devonian fossils, Devonian trilobites. But this time he's going to talk about erythrids in uh, Pennsylvania and New York. If you did not see Dean in November, and I, that's when I was, we were, we were out in Arizona. But uh, Dean is a high school student who's uh, very much ahead of his time for his knowledge, and uh, he's a very avid fossil collector. He knows uh, a lot more than. Uh, a lot of people know about Eurypterads and particularly trilobites. So uh, Dean's an incredible guy, and he'll be ready for us in two weeks. Uh, March 19th, going to be a kind of a fun show. Dr. Kurt Freehoff from Kutztown University is going to show you things under the microscopes that um, you might not believe or you wouldn't think that you could see that. So... Uh, Kurt will be showing you stuff through the scan electron microscope and uh, another scope called the EDS. Uh, April 2nd, it's the Susquehanna River Islands with Jennifer Elek. She's at Susquehanna University. Um, 
She had a new theory about how the Susquehanna River islands have been formed. Uh, so that's going to be an interesting program. April 16th, what do you find in a geologic library with Jody Smale? She is the state librarian at the Pennsylvania Geologic Survey. And I've signed my li life off to her to do this program and, uh, and given her some ideas about how to do the program. So it should be a, it should be a fun time uh, uh, to see what's in the library at Middletown at the office of the Pennsylvania Geologic Survey. May the 7th uh, is, is the rise and fall of the Appalachian, the same program I'm doing in Waynesboro a few days before. Uh, these are for the ones that are going on a bus trip that can't get to Waynesboro. And uh, anybody, anybody has any programs or ideas for later in the summer? We're looking. So uh, a few of you have given us programs that have worked out very well. So uh, anyway, and there you go, Mel. <laughs> Thank you, Jerry. So like I mentioned um, during our last Zoom rock room, uh, coming up, uh, York County Parks has their Maple Sugaring Days. Actually, this weekend is going to be our first event weekend. So it's coming up very quickly. Um, I am in crunch time trying to set everything up and prepare everything for everybody and all of our visitors. Um, so like I said, uh, Maple Sugaring Days is an inside and outside event. It is all self-guided. Um, a brief admission three a fee of $3.00. Um, but you do get syrup samples, pancake samples, coffee, live music, um, and all the education you can ask for regarding the natural resource. So feel free. It's all family friendly to bring the kids, grandkids, children, um, and have a great weekend. Have a good afternoon with us if you're in the area. Are you giving out free autographs that weekend too? Oh, if you ask for them. Okay. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yep, there you go. All right. And finally, the uh, reminder about the solar eclipse happening on April the 8th. It's what, six weeks away or so, seven weeks away. And uh, you do have to travel into the Midwest or down to Texas, Maine, to be on the line of totality. However, if you don't want to travel, you may come to Cador State Park. It's going to be one of the event areas uh, at the Maine Marine uh, marina area and i and the red line telescopes will be uh offering telescopes and binoculars uh to safely look at the eclipse it's going to be about 91 percent total from here so it's not going to be a, it's not going to be a total total but it'll be pretty close and uh come out it'll be free of charge if you get there early enough the friends of cadores park will be handing out the uh certified solar free glasses free of charge for you to uh to take home so uh by the way if you do buy solar glasses i was telling somebody in the room before we went on the air is uh make sure that the glasses are have a big iso stamp on them and also in the corner uh where the where the uh Earpiece meets the uh, front of the glasses. There should be a ISO number also stamped on the inside there. So if it doesn't have that, it's they're not they're not uh, certified. They're not safe to use. So anyway, um, April eighth will be the total eclipse. It's the last eclipse that's going to cross the continental United States until. What did I say here? 2040, 2045 is the next solar eclipse that will cross our continent. So anyway, a lot going on, okay? And uh, things will be uh, even picking up more as we get into the, the warmer season with more programs and things like that. Before I introduce our speaker tonight, uh, here's a trivia question for you. Maybe Mel might know this answer already, but what insect can live without a head for one week? What insect can live without a head for up to one week? Any 
Anybody have any guesses? Uh, unmute yourself and just give me your guess if you have a guess or put or type it in there. <laughs> I'm just reading. I'm just reading one of the co comments over here. What comedy club do do you work? That must be the male, not the me. <laughs> oh, there's the right answer, Mr. Grigg. Cockroach. I read that. I said, I'll have to pass that on for y'all. Not that I'm impressed. Did you know that answer, Mel? Yes, that would have been my guess also. I would have oh, said cockroach. Okay. I'm just not educated in, in that branch of the science. Okay. With that, I ask you uh, mute yourself if you haven't. If you don't, Mel will do that for you uh, along the uh, along the way. And I know there's a we have a great attendance tonight. Thanks for again for the visitors coming in. And like I said, if you do want to be a part of this on your own uh, optional Tuesdays when you want to join in, uh, send us an email at jonesgeo at comcast dot net. We'll add you to the invite list, and you'll get an invite uh, usually Sunday before the Tuesday. So uh, anyway, time for our speaker, uh, Mr. Greg Herman. Uh, he earned his uh, BS in geology from Ohio University in 1982. And after receiving a, a, a master's in structural geology from the University of Connecticut in 1984, he joined the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection and began regulating industrial facilities that were discharging hazardous uh, waste to groundwater. He transferred to the New Jersey Geologic Survey in 1985 to, and mapped bedrock geology in northern New Jersey, co-authored a revised state geological map in 1996. And afterwards, he managed his GIS computer lab and developed the program's first internet pages while earning a PhD in geology from Rutgers University in 1997. In 2001, he became the survey's first research scientist, obtained grants to study and characterize the physical properties of fractured bedrock aquifers using borehole televiewers and heat pulse flow meters to identify and catalog subsurface water bearing features. He retired from the survey in 2019 after 33 years he now teaches earth science at local colleges and works for Trap Rock Industries. Uh, he has uh, recently published, uh, authored two books on the impact tectonics and provides earth science themes and online geo tools for public use uh, at the website impacttectonics.org. And his most, uh, I guess, his most famous book, the one that he did a program here, right here in Zoom Rock Room, a little over a year ago, Punctuated Tectonic Equilibrium. And uh, that program uh, caused a few, caused me and a couple other geologists in the room to really scratch our head. Like, he had some great evidence about what he was talking about. But tonight, he's um, we're going to move to the moon. And he has some new thoughts about the origin of the lunar impact structures. Oh. So we are happy to welcome back. I'm looking, I've been looking forward to this for a while. Mr. Greg Herman. Woo woo. Thank you very much for that great introduction. I appreciate it. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Um, this uh, work that I'm about ready to present to you tonight represents the culmination of almost 20 years worth of research, part-time at the Geological Survey until I was told that I couldn't do uh, extraterrestrial, other types of uh, astrogeological research there because I didn't really get paid to do it. So that's when I started impacttectonics.org. And since then, um, I have uh, used those geophysical tools at the Geological Survey to start cataloging the subsurface fractures 
throughout the New Jersey region, partly into Pennsylvania, a little bit in New York. And uh, that's when I started realizing that some of the strains that were manifest in the rocks in our region were really um, not from the traditional orogenic thought uh, of how the Appalachians formed, but probably were overprinted by the Chesapeake impact in Chesapeake Bay, Maryland. Um, and that it was a rather heretical idea at the time and I published something on it in 2005 at the National GSA. And since that time, I've been refining the theory. And uh, it gives me great pleasure tonight to present to you the culmination of that theory uh, because um, the missing ingredient to my research was the moon. And um, I, I just overlooked it, I guess, in my, my earlier research, I was focused on first Earth then Mars. And uh, the moon it gives us the telltale features that allows us to make these interpretations with confidence about these far field reaching strains around these large impact craters and then extend it back to Earth at the end. And I think you'll be pleasantly surprised by the, the results. So um, thank you very much. And I have a lot to go through. I, I apologize up front if, if um, I, I speak with you know, a dialect that, that may be unfamiliar to you. Uh, I've been looking at this lunar geology now for about eight months. Uh, it's been a, a grand learning exercise on, on my part and uh, I'm very excited to convey the results to you. So how do I share my screen here, Jerry? I uh, should be able to just, uh, go down and hit share screen at the bottom, if that's where it is. Um, you should... There it is, okay, yeah. yeah. Do you have your program minimized? Yep. I do, let's see, ready? Yeah, Tell me when you can see it. There you go. You now can you got... see it? Yeah, now you gotta do the uh, slideshow start. So you see this, song, and I can't see the, what you're seeing. So what yeah. you see is the structural and geophysical aspects slides. Correct. You see that? Okay, yeah. good. Then I'll start the slideshow. Yep, yeah, start the slideshow. Okay, so the title of the talk is Structural and Geophysical Aspects of Terrestrial Multi-Ring Astrobleams. And uh, in front of you really is the culmination of the research, which shows the interior phase layering of each uh, of these terrestrial bodies, the moon, the Mars, and Earth, with the um, compression wave seismic transmission and reflection paths highlighted relative to the phase boundaries. And I've highlighted the blue uh, ring around the moon and the red ring around Mars to just show you a little bit of trivia here uh, in terrestrial tectonics and in uh, planetary geology. The moon is roughly the same size as Mars core and Mars is roughly the same size as Earth's core, just uh, for um, trivia's sake. So this work advances punctuated tectonic equilibrium as a guiding principle for terrestrial tectonics because it includes the periodic catastrophic tectonic agents that are brought to bear on terrestrial planets and their moons from impacts by hypervelocity kilometer scale bolides, asteroids and comets. So impact tectogenesis and tectonic inheritance are two sub principles that help exemplify the, the and help us understand how these impact tectonic far field strains, these ITFF strains are manifested in targeted terrestrial bodies. Um, I first noticed the strains on the North American continent shown to the right with the Chesapeake here in our backyard and the Chicxulub in the, off the Yucatan Peninsula in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, just real quick, can you see my, uh, my cursor on the screen there when I'm highlighting things? Yeah. yeah. Okay, good. Um, and I also noticed these far-reaching strain fields on Mars as for the Sirius Sinai Solus Planum Astrobleam with a 2,900-kilometer ring here shown around the center of this strewn field, which has the largest volcano in the solar system, Olympus Mons, in its wake, along with Tharsis Montes, three other volcanic constructs in the extensional wake of this astrobleam, which compressed and uplifted the downrange um, expression of Solus Planum. Now on Earth, 
um, we have geodynamic consequences to these large energy fluxes as well. Uh, for instance, um, the the impact that, that happened in the Gulf of Mexico, the Chicxulub at 66 million years, not only wiped out uh, many of the reptilian fauna, but also is probably responsible for a phase of uplift of the Colorado Plateau, the Llano uplift in the foreland realm, extensional um, subduction behind it in the tensional sector here. And if you notice these yellow uh, arrows, what we see is the American set of tectonic plates are actually rotating around the point of impact, the point of energy flux. So 66 million years later, we're still operating on a geodynamic scheme on Earth, reflective of this event from a approximately a 20 to 30 kilometer diameter asteroid impacting the Gulf of Mexico, excavating it out immediately downrange and uplifting much of the Western orogenic region at that time. I began using 3D CAD models and benchtop experiments to characterize these spherical strain fields that I was seeing on these different planetary bodies. And here I show uh, three perspectives of an AutoCAD model showing the overlapping welting around the Chicxulub and Chesapeake on the North American continent. I also constructed models in SketchUp Pro, another CAD system, which you can bring into Google Earth and display, raise up out of the ground in order to characterize these strain fields, these massive far-reaching strain fields. The benchtop experiments that I ran, I used an air pistol, shot a hardened steel projectile through a PVC tube into glass balls at varying impact angles that were adjusted by raising the gun incrementally in quarter inch stages to achieve low versus high impacts. And I studied the characteristic strain fields resulting from these tests. Now I wanna go over these very quickly because serendipitously they show exactly what we see on these terrestrial bodies. When you have high angle impacts, you have these circular features which have axial symmetry from having a direct high angle uniaxial compression on the solid object. But as the angle of, uh, of impact decreases systematically from high angle to low angle, you get a switch from axial symmetric to planar symmetric representation of the strain fields. You get fan shapes at moderate angles and you get very limited strain fields with uh, faults and fractures that flare out in lateral sectors at very low angles. Now, I'm showing you one of these glass balls here on the lower right-hand side, which was the most energetic strain test that I was able to conduct using these apparatus. I ran two different tests in 2019 in order to start the experimentation of the way projectiles will impact spherical surfaces. And in this particular case, um, I was able to run a second test, which I was able to differentiate out between the concentric fractures and the radial fractures. And when you plot up the distribution of the radial fractures from high to low impact angles, you see a systematic changing uh, from um, axis, uh, a, a double shear response with conjugate fractures bracketing the target direction or the heading direction of the bolide to again, the uh, expression of uh, low angle impacts having um, fractures and faults that flare out normal to the impact direction. So characteristic behavioral responses, structural responses. A set of set, a second set of, or first set of impacts showed these same trends, but I didn't have the apparatus really in a really controlled environment. I had to refine it in order to run the second set of tests to achieve a higher um, um, rate of success and certainty in, in the statistics. But here you should see a uniaxial compression test on a piece of rock with this, this characteristic axial splitting that occurs when you basically compress something uh, in a uniaxial mode like indenters will do from bolide impacts. So I was started characterizing these, these far-reaching strain fields, these ITFF strain fields, for Mars and Earth, and I started developing CAD models representing their extents and their geometry. Um, and the glass ball experiment at the highest impact angle showed me the geometry of these refracted wedges that occurred downrange. 
as opposed to uprange where you get extension. And we'll go into that in a little bit more detail later. But the earlier work and that which was pu published in Punctuated Tectonic Equilibrium, the first book, was anemic and the relative uh, importance of seismic reflections was underdeveloped. So this work tonight fills in that gap by filling in the seismological constraints stemming from reflected shock energy when these large hypervelocity impacts hit these terrestrial bodies. So this work includes a structural study of the moon's surface and planetary interior with considerations of how reflected seismic energy is partitioned and focused in the mantle and crust. The moon lacks an atmosphere and plate tectonics, so the geology of the moon mostly stems from impact tectogenesis and gives the clearest picture of ITFF strains manifest by accretionary terrestrial bodies. Lunar seismological concepts are then extended to Mars and Earth at the end to spatially constrain refracted and reflected shock ITFF strains occurring around large craters. Now, just for a point of emphasis, the moon is, sacri is, is sacred ground in planetary geology because it really gives us a key to syst a solar system evolution. So I'm treading on very hollowed ground here. And it's taken me a long time to get up to speed and I'm sure that there will be emissions, but I wanna bring to your attention some very pertinent literature that I rested this research on. Okay, this work is an exercise in geologic mapping and structural analysis using analytical geometry and it's not numerical modeling. And structural insights are gained from applying empirical results obtained from missile impact tests from both traditional and atomic bomb seismology. So it complements Malcolm McKinnon's 1978 ring tectonic theory which is the only theory out there right now to explain how multi-ring basins on the moon have formed. So here are the pertinent uh, references that I used in this work. Shock transmission through a solid-solid interface done by General Dynamics in response to the early atomic bomb testing. Malish McKinnon's mechanics of ring basin formation. Moore's missile impact tests by USGS Geology studying the geometry of oblique tests into sand. Telford and others traditional seismology through applied geophysics, and then waters, lunar wrinkle ridges, and evolution in nearside lithosphere, which provided a blue gay gravity map, which has been indispensable for this research. Here are two examples of Mellon McKinnon's 1978 ring tectonic theory. And um, this is very valid, I'm sure, for the um, near cratered regions and to explain how you get um, first cratering, excavation, rebound from a plunger type of effect in these large impact basins and then gravitational collapse of the central peak. But most of the time when you see application of this ring tectonic theory, most of the faults are depicted in a very cartoonish manner, like either shown on the left here or to the right at the bottom, where you have these multi-ring basins that can span 1,500 to 2,000 kilometers radius at 4,000 kilometers diameter, and they just end these, these faults basically in Listerick style in, in the, the lower crust upper mantle. And the thing about this theory is that it requires a fluid substrate in order to allow these block rotations to happen. And what I'm going to show you is that there is no fluid substrate under the crust of the moon. So there has to be other mechanisms to account for what we're seeing. In this research, I use Google Earth Pro. QGIS desktop, the free GIS desktop that anybody can download and use, the SketchUp Pro computer-aided drafting system, which costs a yearly subscription of about a thousand bucks or something like that, and the MS PowerPoint and Expression software. I use Expression for doing the blogging, okay? Now, let's jump into the moon, uh, this out-of-the-world theory here. This is a digital terrain model obtained by laser um, satellite imaging by NASA. And it shows in great detail the Mare lowlands underlain by upper mantle and basaltic flows versus the North Acidic feldspathic ridge highlands, which you can see is a swath that runs um, east to west. This is the near side that we always see from Earth, the old man in the moon with the eyes here. 
So I just want you to pay attention here to the expression of this North Acidic Feldspathic Ridge Highlands relative to this large impact basin to the south, the deepest impact basin called the South Pole Aiken Basin. This is Mare Imrium, Serenitatis, Nectaris, Chrysium, and look at this bullseye astrobleam right here called Mare Oriental. You can clearly see multiple rings around it, and we're going to go into the seismology which explains this. Here is a, um, a NASA picture of the laser altimetry used to collect this digital terrain model data. Here's my interpretation of the 18 largest multi-ring astrobleams on the surface with individual rings spaced out and noted in kilometers at the varying radii around each impact center. The headings are all interpreted here based on the fracture patterns and other criteria that I'm going to briefly mention later. And I want to draw your attention to this orange line right here, which basically circumscribes the, the moon and separates the highlands out to the south from the highlands and Mare Imbrium impact basin of Oceanic, Oceanus Procolarum to the north. So there's a hemispherical dichotomy here on the moon that we can only see by, by these geographic displays, and we can't really see it. It, it, with our visible naked eye without remote sensing because we only see the one side of the moon. Now, we have detailed seismic data for the moon collected in this central region right here on the near side where we basically deployed a passive seismometer first in 1969 with the Apollo 11 mission. That was followed up with a seismic array deployed by 12 through 16 within this yellow circle. So we understand what the structure of the interior is based on seismometry of the moon. And I want to go into the nature now of how shock energy gets partitioned off the different interfaces in the interior of the moon. Energy fluxes at layered interfaces in any terrestrial body are determined using acoustic impedances and wave incident angles, wave incidence angles. Acoustic impedance is the product of wave velocity and material density. So under ordinary conditions, as gravitational increases towards the center of a terrestrial body, you will get increasing density as you go deeper within the body. But occasionally, because of, of, of phase transitions and crystalline uh, structural changes or partial melting, you can get phase reversals where density decreases interior-wise. So ge applied geophysics shows us basically that under the normal case where density increases towards the center of a body, most of the energy introduced by an impact, which is compressional energy, 80% of that energy is going to be directly transmitted through the body at incidence angles all the way up to about 60 degrees where you start getting high amounts of reflected energy. Now, this is the normal case when density increases downward towards the center of a body. But in the case where you have a, a acoustic um, impedance decreasing across a layered boundary, like the outer core of earth and the layered mantle, you go from plastic to liquid, so velocity decreases. Applied seismology shows us that in those cases, here you have a line where you have density decreasing by a factor of 0.5. Most of the energy introduced at the surface is transmitted through the body until you get into reflection angles of 30 degrees to 60 degrees. At 60 degree reflection angles, almost 100% of the energy introduced into the interior of the body of a, a planet or a moon will be reflected back to the surface off of these acoustic inverted boundaries. Here's a diagram showing where those, uh, those boundaries occur on the moon. In, uh, you have basically two upper mantle layers. You have a lower mantle layer here and two or three other mantle layers approaching the core of the moon. Representation wise, we have shock waves introduced at an impact here that are emanating down through the layers. They hit these inverted acoustic impedance contrast boundaries and they reflect energetically off back up to the surface. Why is this important? Because if you consider undisturbed material 
represented by equally spaced lines, and you have a normal compression wave with a leading material closer together and the following material stretched in its wake as the wave passes through along these ray paths, when they hit these inverted acoustic impedance boundaries, the compression waves turn into rarefaction waves where you have leading tension return to the surface of the earth. Material in terrestrial realms fails readily under tension so that when you get these rarefaction waves returning at 60 degree and 30 degree angles off of these layers, you start inciting crustal failure and magnetism at these far reaches away from the craters. Here's the velocity model that is a consensus reference model from the Apollo data by Weber and others showing you the P wave and S wave profiles of the moon all the way down to the inner core and where the phase transitions occur where you get these inverted impedance contrast boundaries. And when you draw 30 degree and 60 degree reflection angles off of those boundaries, this is where you're gonna get the reflected energy focus. The biggest impacts are going to have reflections coming off of this, the most prominent phase reversal of the lower mantle two to lower mantle three boundary before you get into the core. So this is a SketchUp Pro 2020 layered model that includes the crust, two upper mantle layers, three lower mantle layers, and both an outer and inner core. The spatial limits of the representative impact basins as defined by the concentric fault systems that we saw earlier agree very well with the primary shock reflections rising off these different boundaries. So I'm able to build these models, these reference models in SketchUp that I can bring into Google Earth and I can bring into these SketchUp models to compare with the imagery to see how these reflections align with the concentric faults that we're seeing in these multi-ring impact basins. Now, in addition to the reflection geometry, we also have the refraction geometry. Remember the wedge in the glass ball? That's the first phase. When these things hit, in this case, in these large lunar basins, they, these are hundreds of kilometers diameter bolides that basically have remelted vast portions of the lunar crust early in its history. They're coming in statistically at these oblique angles, like 45 degree angles. When they hit, they spall off, they fragment, they create secondary basins, strewn fields, where you get a one, two impact event, and then you have down range wedging followed by the reflections minutes later. Catastrophic ITFF strains on the moon. Now, in order to put this into perspective and look at the details of these things, I want to first draw your attention to the right where we parameterize the missile and target aspects. So we have four oblique impacts. We have this plane of trajectory. Remember, we go from axial to planar symmetry. Well, the plane of trajectory holds the heading of the bolide, which is the principal axis of crustal compression, sigma one. So we have a plane of trajectory. We have bilateral symmetry coming out here in these lateral sectors. We have downrange compression. And we have uprange extension. With respect to the moon chronology, this is very complex, so I want to step you through it very carefully here. These are the known large multi-ring astrobleams represented in time on the moon in a relative sense. We don't have absolute ages on these. Most of the samples that we collected, the one third ton of samples that we've collected from the Apollo and other um, Soviet moon missions are basically loose samples and regolith samples. And I don't think we have many outcrop samples in order to constrain things absolutely yet. So a lot of this is inferred in a relative sense. But here are the major astrobleams scaled by their diameters. The largest one here in uh, um, the South Pole Aiken Basin is huge by comparison and remelted remelt vast regions. The second largest, the Imbrium impact here, occurred early in the history of the moon. The moon was probably spalled off Earth about 4.5 billion years ago. The oldest sample that we have radiometric ages for from samples collected by Apollo are 4.45 to 4.36 billion years old from Apollo 16 fan sample 60025. 
So that's the oldest known North Acidic crust that we have sampled on the moon. Here's the oldest Earth gneiss sitting up here at about 4.05 billion years old. The oldest impact melt has been dated at about 3.9, right here where we have this late heavy bombardment phase where everything came in all at once as a result of the solar system adjustments of the, the large outer planets, the gas planets, spurred some activity of the inner solar, of the inner asteroid belt. We had a, a large phase of, of bombardment here, which is a theoretical period that, that could have happened. But I also want to bring to your attention here, this is our oldest known impact basin on Earth at 2.2 billion. So we have a whole history here on Earth that really is unclear because of the turnover and the tectonics and, the, and, and having plates consumed by active plate orogenesis on Earth. The youngest basalt sampled is here. So we have a representative bombardment curve brought in here from Tartis and others. Uh, showing you the decreasing bombardment uh, uh, rates through time. And these are the, uh, the sizes uh, up to about 0.1 kilometer um, um, bolides. Just very quickly, uh, the oldest sample that I just mentioned that we have a uh, sample for on the moon, uh, this 60025 is a cataclysite. So the oldest sample that we have radiometric dates on is already structurally obliterated. And I think is probably a result of the South Pole Aiken Basin impact that I'm about ready to show you, which is mind boggling big. It's about 98% plagioclase, 4.4 billion years old. Large plagioclase crystals have been fractured, crushed. Twinned. <clears throat> so this just reminds you that whenever you pick up material on the moon, loose material, it could come from anywhere. Here's the statistics that I tally in ta table one. Uh, the gray cells over here are the different ring radiuses as compared to the theoretical square root of two that was published early on in the lunar history. Uh, it stems from theory that these rings develop on a square root of two ratio, but yet only less than half of the, of the rings that I measured fall into that ratio. So I don't really think that that's something we can really hang our hats on. I think it more has to do with seismological dispersion of energy and, and traditional structural geologic responses. Here's the Grail gravity map. <laughs> Here's that spa line showing you the effects of this large South Pole lunar basin impact, which probably remelted vast regions of the island's crust. And now we have other five large impacts in this realm right here that face Earth on the near side. And I want to show you these mass concentrations called mascons which are gravity mass concentrations represented by either upper material, upper mantle material, or basic mare, which runs around 3.3 grams per cc compared to the lunar anorthosites, which are about 2.9 grams per cc. So big density contrasts. There are also, from this earlier slide, two types of, of anorthosites have been recognized on the moon. One is uh, ferroin, infused with iron relative to the pure ones. I think these ones that are infused with iron stem from this large event down here because they rim it like so. And I think the more pure anorthosites probably stem from rejuvenation by these larger impacts to the north. But I'm showing you now these different geographic maps with 11 different geospatial themes that are available for the moon. Here's the Bouguet gravity map. Bouguet gravity takes into consideration gravitational effects by terrain. So you remove the terrain effects and you're left with these low gravity areas where you have cataclysis and you have broken material that are lower density than the higher dense undisturbed material ponding in the center of these big multi-ring depressions. I went underwent two phases of fault interpretations for this moon based on these geospatial themes. One is in dark lines and one is in the thin gray lines. The dark lines stem from this Bouguet gravity uh, intensity map, or excuse me, a gradient map by Waters in 2002. He published this, uh, which shows how these large impact basins get ringed with these fault systems of low density shown here with negative Bouguet gradients. Whereas the 
bouguet gravy gradients around these large impact basins with these red signatures probably represent magmatic intrusion along faults, high intensity gravity gradients versus low intensity gravity gradients caused by breaking material and causing it to be decreased in density. I also want to bring in, in your attention to the South Pole Basin here, because you can clearly see two different geophysical anom anomalies cross-cutting one another. The first braided blue cataclysite fault systems associated with this astroblame, and then it's overprinted by these radial red blotches, which I think are faults with dikes intruded, radial dikes associated with the reflections. I'll show you that here in a minute. Here's the J Japanese uh, Selim magnetic survey that was done of the moon. And I show you this because uh, I wanna draw your attention to these high magnetic anomalies at, this, at the forefront of the South Pole Aiken Basin. Uh, the moon doesn't really have much of a magnetic intensity. It's about one-tenth of that which we have here on Earth. But when you contour it like this, you do see some north-south stripes like this that are paralleling the rotation axis and may be some kind of iron banding associated with the remelting of these different cations from these large impacts. Here is a map of lunar prospector spectroscopy for silicon in weight percentage. We've mapped the moon's surface in detail with the lunar prospector at about 200 meter grid cells. So roughly two football field length grid cells of the varying chemistry, iron, silica, aluminum, rare earth elements, we have it all now for the moon. And when you put it together like this, then you can do comparative analysis of where these different minerals vary by the different astrobleams. Here, you can see high silica distributed all through the highlands associated with this starburst pattern down here around the South Pole Aiken Basin. Here, we have silica deficient crust, aluminum deficient crust in this terrain called PKT. Uh, it's uh, basically uh, a creep, it's called Procorel, Procorel, Procolarum creep terrain. And it's basically enriched with upper mantle minerals and excavated out and distributed around these large impact basins. This is um, aluminum, silica, aluminum. So aluminum is, is also uh, low in this excavated area. Iron is rich in the PKT realm and also enriched in the foreland of the South Pole Aiken Basin. A little smattering of enrichment or associated with some of these other uh, large impact basins, but for the most part concentrated in the largest two. Potassium. Potassium is an upper mantle signature and it only occurs basically in the Mare Ibrium Serentatus astroblemes and a little bit to the forefront of the South Pole Aiken Basin. And here is uranium. Uranium is basically the same as thorium. You see the fan-shaped pattern here. Now, the PKT terrain stands for this Procolarum creep terrain. It's enriched in incompatible elements like potassium, rare earth elements, phosphorus, uranium, thorium. It constitutes this lower uh, bracketing layer below the crust, which is the uppermost mantle material. And based on my work here and knowledge of the way that these reflection, uh, shock reflections come off the different layered boundaries, what I'm proposing is that we have a two-phase two -phase process of operation here. The first phase is impacting excavation downrange. Somebody needs to turn off their, their uh, Cynthia, can you please turn off your microphone? Um, we have some downrange wedging, I think, which arches the upper mantle to the surface. So excavation near the crater, these pseudo tacolite fa faults following these refracted wedges and a little bit of uplift here, partial melting down around the region where we see the velocity decreasing slightly. And then the uh, inverted acoustic boundary here where you get the major reflections coming off with partial melting incited along these tensional 
crustal spalling faults. The structures are crazy, and I'm not going to spend much time on this other than the point up here. And uh, you know, you can run these things through radial histograms in order to understand the trends of the associated faults from the different astroblames. This is a tally of all the large faults on the moon, and it predominantly is showing you trends associated with this large impact in the South Pole. I'll show you that here in a second. When I tally up the different astroblame headings that I measured, they show a north directed preference, the same as for Mars. So basically what this says is that things are coming from the south horizon and impacting the north, uh, towards the north preferentially. And that agrees with the hemispherical dichotomy we see on all the different terrestrial planets, including Earth, Mars, and the Moon. So keep your eye out for the Southern Hemisphere. Speaking of the Southern Hemisphere, here's the expression topographically and gravitationally of this South Pole Aiken Basin. It's massive. The main impact was here at the South Pole. Again, it was formed by a very, very large 100-kilometer scale bolide that basically fractured, then spalled off and created a secondary impact realm. In the literature, the, they have a, the center reported here. My, my, my calculated center is very close to what has been reported in the literature. The zero-meter elevation line basically ex, uh, circumscribes the limits of the impact basin. But you can see here on the gravity that the impact ITFF radial fractures extend way out beyond the basin. And in some cases, almost the, span the entire latitudinal hemisphere. Here you can see that most of the fractures are at a high angle to the impact direction, which indicates that this is probably a low angle impact like the benchtop impact experiments show. Here's the, the magnetic expression of this large impact basin, radial fractures. And I want to draw your attention to these three yellow dots. These are antipodes to the large impacts on the other side of the moon. So even the glass ball impact experiments showed antipodal cracking to the most energetic effects. And what we're seeing here is iron accumulated around where these antipodes occur so there's, in addition to wedging and uplift of the upper mantle associated with these large astrobleams, there's also antipodal thermal effects from cracking and magnetism on the other side of the moon relative to where these other mass gums occur up in the Imbrium and Serenitatis region. So here is a really nice correlation between the Chrysium antipode and a magnetic flare in the highlands. This is the regular gravity expression of the um, South Pole Aiken Basin. And here's an auto, the SketchUp, excuse me, the SketchUp Pro model showing you the 30 and 60 degree reflection boundaries relative to the main impact center, secondary impact center, and where the radio faults occur stemming from the reflected energy. So we have two sets of fractures forming as a result of this massive impact. The first blue set are magmatically inactive, probably cataclysite, pseudo tacolite faults as a result of refraction and transmission strain, whereas the pink radial fractures here are reflected fractures that superimpose and cross-cut the earlier fractures. And you can see that here in the gravitational anomalies again, where the red cut right across the blue. This uh, 3D model of the SketchUp Pro moon model shows basically the extent of the South Pole, largest impact basin, and then this menagerie of four other, five other astrobleams overlapping on the near side up here. The um, spectroscopy of the South Pole Aiken, ba Aiken base shows uh, data emissions because of the way that I was using the data to derive contoured values. Um, the data are presented by NASA at cell centers. So when you contour those cell centers up, you're left with emissions along the grid layer, uh, the grid cell boundaries in these geographic maps, and that causes these little data emissions. But basically, you can see aluminum is decreased, downrange, iron is increased, potassium and uranium from the upper mantle is also increased downrange. 
This is the second largest impact basin. The Mare Imbrium, Serentatus, and Nectaris overlapping astroblemes, together constituting Oceanic Oceanus Procolarum, that great swath of mare basalt and melted rock that we're really uncertain of what the age of this stuff is. It could be multiple ages from the different overlapping strain effects of these different large astroblemes. And you can actually see the effects of the overlapping here in the gravity intensity or uh, the gravity horizontal gradient map. The, this gradient map was just indispensable because it shows these U-shaped gravitational anomalies in the center of these basins. The U-shape with the heading forms a trident, which allows you to predict the orientation of these astroblem impacts with a high degree of certainty. Since Serentatus, you have the U-shape here, the trident coming up in this direction, Embrium came in in this direction, Serentatus predated Imbrium. So the manner in which the seismic shock energy is dispensed within the let within this body is going to be affected by the inherited tectonic structures. Here's uh, the magnetic expression of Mare Imbrium, Serentatus, and the mascons from the free air gravity. I want to bring your attention really quick to the way that these rings overlap one another here, here, and here. You have these gravitational flaring occur along these faults. Magmatic intrusion, fault-mediated ascent of magma in response to the reflection of these different shock waves. Mapping, uh, constructing a moon model uh, um, and looking at the Imbrium, Serentatus, Nectaris, overlapping strain fields, it looks pretty much like this. Uh, it's, it's messy. And um, I think that having strain hardened shells associated with the older Nectaris, the intermediate age Serentatus, and then the youngest Imbrium affects how these faults are manifest as a result of having to deal with the previously shocked material. Well, this is a diagram illustrating the three lunar astrobleams astro and how these gravitational uh, flares correlate very nice with magmatic intrusions along their intersections. So basically, you're getting one punch of one, two, three uh, rings around these fractures around this older impact are excavated out and remelted by the younger, excavated out and remelted by another younger. But you basically have these cone, cup, and saucer-shaped ITFF structures that are overlapping in the upper mantle. And this is the, the spectroscopic expression of Mare Imbrium again, uh, basically basically showing upper, upper mantle uh, exposed in the core of this feature. I'm going to end up uh, the moon discussion basically by looking at Mare Oriental, which which is amazing when you consider the fact that we have mountainous rings sitting five, 600 kilometers away from where the impact occurred on the moon that we call Cordelleran rings. We're seeing mountains formed on the, on the moon as a result of these impacts, and yet we do not prescribe the same mechanics for Earth, which is mind blowing to me because they're both terrestrial bodies and they're gonna respond in the same manner. It's just that things like this are masked on Earth by sedimentation, atmospheric weathering, and tectonic cycles. But you can see here, uh, when you bring in, well, Mare Oriental is, is a good example of, of axial splitting associated with this pattern. So I selected basically all the fall patterns within the outer ring of Mare Oriental, plotted them up, charted them up, and this was probably a high angle impact. Uh, this is how it looks in the Google Earth Pro native stock imagery. And look at this, Lacus Varus, Autumni, and Estasis are mare ring dikes ponded within these, these little depressions that they call lakes, okay? Um, what these are are ring dikes formed along extensional faults in the wake, again, of these oblique impacts where you're pushing up the foreland, extending the hinterland, and it's the same exact geometry that you see in the missile impact tests in the sand. So here's the SketchUp moon model of Mare Oriental. 
it's a smaller impact, so we don't see the degree of radial fracturing and intrusions like we see around the larger impacts, but there's still evidence for it occurring. The 30 and 60 degree envelopes uh, and the puffed up outer collar of Mare Orientale, probably from some sort of iron infusion of the of the crust. So from Tartese and others, I want to just summarize a couple of aspects about the moon. It's not a primitive planetary body, but it has a complex geologic history of differentiation, impact modification, and extensive volcanic activity. And it's all because of impacts. Primordial crust of the moon includes magnesium and iron-rich mare, very similar to that upper mantle material on Earth. The age of the moon's formation is determined from the ages of the oldest available lunar samples. So a total of one third ton of rock and soil samples have been brought to Earth, back to Earth by the Apollo and Luna programs between 69 and 76, not much since then. The fan rocks, the, the pure or the, the ferrous and north acidic rocks are believed to represent the remnants of an ancient lunar crust formed as flotation cumulates in the lunar magma ocean. I disagree with that. I think the fan rocks are generated by the South Pole Aiken Basin impact, and they reworked something that was originally younger and uh, older and more primitive. Now, the age has been determined from fan sample 60025, but again, remember that was the North Acidic um, crushed up feldspar rich rock. So we've mapped the geology of the moon in detail using mineralogy mappers on, on Indian and, and NASA probes. We have identified areas on the moon where we have lithologies that we have not sampled. We have spectroscopy details on the moon ranging from 100 to 250 meter pixel details, again, down to the level of football fields. <clears throat> but we have no direct sampling from the far side, from the spa, from that huge basin, which is probably responsible for generating much of the crust. So much of what I'm talking about here is purely speculative until that that uh, those samples can be obtained. Now, one last piece of trivia about the moon, and this uh, I never really considered in my, all of my, my, my geologic career. I just took the moon for granted. I always see the same side. We always see the same side of the moon. And when you look into it, it's just an amazing phenomenon because it's called lunar tidal locking. When you look at the way that the face of the moon, the old man in the moon faces us constantly, perpetually, so we never see the, the far side, it's because these five or six different astroblings with mass concentrations create a heavy side of the moon that gets gravitationally locked into Earth such that that face always rotates around and faces Earth so that it rotates one, spins once on its axis for every rotation around in a lunar cycle. That's called tidal locking. It also happens on Mercury. And it's just an amazing phenomenon to consider, especially since we're 384,000 kilometers away from the moon. And those subtle yet powerful gravitational effects determine the face of the moon that we always see. And we have to overcome obstacles in order to actually sample the far side of the moon because of the lack of transmission of communication. We need satellites set up in order to do that. So when we backtrack and take the results of this lunar study and look at Mars, we can use the same predictive seismology, the same phase transitions where reflected energy is going to be most robust coming off the outer core. And sure enough, those dimensions line up perfectly with the dimensions of the astroblings. On Earth, it, the first phase transition, the negative phase transition we get with P and S wave velocities occurs at the outer core boundary at 2,900 kilometers depth. And if we take a 60 degree angle off of the outer core depth, that translates roughly into a 5,000 kilometer radius strain field. What does that mean? Well, it means that we have this process where we're going to have downrange refraction and wedging at various scales, depending upon the size of the impacts. Smaller impacts are going to have smaller wedges. Larger impacts are going to have larger wedges. And we're going to get these energetic reflections, reflections coming off the outer core boundary. At, at distances of 2,900 to 5,000 kilometers. 
Why is that important? Well, ladies and gentlemen, this is the most astounding thing that, that came out of all of this. Here's the Congo impact, the suspected Congo impact at 200 million years in the center of the Congo basin in the center of Africa. Here's the gravitational expression of that. Here is the 5,000 kilometer ring coming around the Congo impact. Oh, it just happens to correspond with all of the orogenic belts of the Pan-Eurasian uh, um, mobile, mobile belts. But most importantly, that 5,000 kilometer ring where you would get rarefaction waves pulling the crust apart and inciting magnetism is exactly the dimensions of where the central Atlantic magmatic province occurs relative to the Congo Basin, 5,000 kilometers distance. Oh, and by the way, at that time, Australia and India also started their journeys westward and northward to collide in with Asia and then rest into the uh, Pacific. To show you an example of these sealed dye complexes, part of the Central Atlantic Magmatic Province, probably spurred on by reflections coming off of the outer core from the Congo impact, here is a fault-mediated ascent of Central Atlantic Magmatic Province magma coming up a fault as exposed in the New Jersey Moore Station trap rock quarry. Here's the trap sill. Here are the dikes coming up the faults as shown here on the upper left. It's wonderful that we have this in our backyard to, uh, to ponder uh, on the effects of these, these uh, features. So this work advances punctuated tectonic equilibrium as a guiding principle for terrestrial tectonics because it includes the periodic catastrophic tectonic agents that are brought to bear on terrestrial planets and their moons from hypervelocity kilometer scale bolide impacts. Impact tectogenesis and tectonic inheritance are exemplified as complementary principles that can help guide research into the manner in which ITFF strains are manifest in targeted terrestrial bodies. And seismological and structural principles help explain the ITF radial and concentric extension faulting and associated magnetism seen in terrestrial astrobleams. And so, just keep in mind that when big things hit big things, <laughs> big things happen. Here's a heterogeneous delivery of silicate and metal to the earth by large planetesimals, showing you the effects. <clears throat> on the right is shown the thermal variations, on the left, the material accretion variations. And if you pay attention to the one on the right, you'll see that these large impacts probably kick-started subduction. So thank you very much. Um, that is the end of the talk. Uh, I just want to remind you very quickly again that you can download the Google Earth file um, that represents all of the lunar research that I just presented from my website under the KMLZ's link. The uh, next book is in the works because I have to upgrade uh, and finish the theory that I started with punctuated tectonic equilibrium. And uh, thank you very much. Yeah, that was great. <laughs> Again, you're leaving me, uh, leaving me some, uh, my head's kind of wobbling a little bit. <laughs> yeah, mine too. <laughs> mine too. Um, well, before I stop sharing, I just want to show you one thing, okay? And um, if anybody's interested in this research, I'm willing to share it for free. This is um, the Google, this is the SketchUp Pro model of the moon, all right? And basically I'm showing you the gravitational intensity and the way that these intensity flares are associated with these different um, features. And you could turn on and off the different features, the magmatically active concentric uh, dike, ring dikes versus defaults, et cetera. Now, um, I do have some questions in the chat room. Uh, should I go ahead and address those? Yes, if you would, please. Um, has my work been presented in the scientific journals? Um, no, it has not because um, 
they scoff at my work so far. And I've been actually thinking about submitting this one to a journal um, because I think that it has enough uh, temerity to pass muster. But then again, I have to remind everybody out there that it's not the same world as it was 20 years ago. And they usually have to pay you two or four grand to publish something in a scientific journal. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'm more relying on, 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 publishing my work through uh, self-publishing on Amazon because until somebody comes up and says, Hey, this is really cool. Would you like to publish this? And, you know, guarantee me a spot. I, I I'm tired of the ridicule that I receive when I submit it to journals uh, because this is, um, this is heretical. Plate tectonic you... theory currently does not include any energetics associated with large astroblade or large cometary or asteroid impacts on Earth. And Jerry, I hope that when you talk about the rising and falling of the Appalachians, that you include the potential of how the Chesapeake helped raise the Appalachians. I have already... right now the Appalachians are are only considered to be orogenically lifted during the Taconic. Acadian and, and Appalachian orogenies, and that's not true. The I Chesapeake had a yeah. major effect on that. The uh, the Appalachians used to drain to the Atlantic Ocean until the Chesapeake effect happened, and then the uh, drainage switched to the Ohio Valley after raising the Blue Ridge. And I can't I can't even begin to to convey to you how important it is to consider the energetics of these of these events because uh it's going to rewrite the way we we think about orogenic cycles and um right so to answer the question succinctly no i haven't presented in scientific journals because uh it's a really hard sell right there in scientific journals they don't believe that enough energy gets into the ground to raise mountains can i recommend a journal to publish in what can I recommend a journal to publish in? Which one? Journal of Irre Irreproducible Results. <laughs> yeah. I, I had to hit you with that, Greg. How about the 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 tin the tin hat society? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the flat earth society is gonna get it. Hey, I have a question. When was the earth from my understanding is earth was impacted by a body and it spalled off the moon? Four and, so, half billion, uh, four and a half billion years ago, right. You, you, well, the Earth was just basically forming it. You know, they, they envision magmatic oceans and this and that and the other thing, but uh, it, it's, it just seems it, it seems like it, ha it would have to occur at a later time. And you, although you may be you seeing mean, those You mean days. the moon formation? Yeah. Well, you we do have the radiometric dates, you know, so that's, well, they, they and, and that's reflect, why, it's, that's why it's really important to get sampling on the far side in order to constrain the age of solar system evolution, because all of our estimates on solar system evolution right now are based on lunar sampling. Oh, yeah. Huh? Yeah, that's it. We don't have we don't have direct sampling on Mars or Mercury or anything else. Only the only the moon. And uh, a lot of people will argue that we even even went there. <laughs> yeah, well. but, you know, we've have a, ton, a third of a ton of samples that we've analyzed. So yeah, we were there. Um, we haven't been back in a long time, but but uh, the other question Kurt asks is: Are ring dikes on Earth caused by impacts of magma that form from impacts filling the front? Yes, I, I think that I just showed you that I think. The uh, impetus behind the Newark Rift Basin sequence from Georgia to Nova Scotia is the impact in the Congo Basin and reflections arising off of the outer core from that event spur the breakup of Pangaea. And, and that's not really a far stretch because that's exactly the time when India and Australia started their journey north from Pangaea something broke up Pangaea suddenly. And uh, the 5,000 kilometer radius reflection off the outer core sits right under the Newark Basin sequence. So yeah, you know, I think, I think that uh, ring dikes on earth can be caused by these. 
but ring dikes can also be caused by, you know, caldera, caldera failure, you know, and other tensional features. The important thing to remember is this. As a structural geologist, it took me a long time to appreciate how easily earth material fails under tension. You can compress the crap out of it and it will resist compression and will resist compression until the pores close up and it finally breaks. But when you pull things apart, they fail readily. Hmm. They, there's hardly any left side to the more circle <laughs> because you pull on something, it stretches and breaks. So when these rarefaction waves are coming up off of the uh, these phase boundaries, they're first arrival tension waves that are pulling the crust apart from below. And this has never been considered in in you know in in astrobleem uh, you know or genesis or anything else, and that's why this this study has been so rewarding for me because I finally have put two and two together to explain how these things form from a seismologically constrained approach, which is fun. That that five thousand kilometer ring that you showed is that the inner core outer core boundary the uh mantle outer core boundary the mantle. phase boundary between the plastic mantle and the liquid outer core uh -huh. so it's a major acoustic impedance decrease mm. and a major reflector and uh unfortunately i i didn't really uh appreciate that when i did my first work i was more focused on refracted effects mm. because in seismology if you've taken, you know, college size, uh, you know, geophysics, you understand that that when you have a seismic source, you have uh, partitioning between refracted and transmitted energy or reflected energy. So refractions arrive first, reflections arrive second. And uh, why wouldn't it be that way with these large shock events? You know, well, in fact, it is. You can see the effects from the anomalies crossing each other on the moon. So the moon has been a perfect palette <clears throat> for um, deducing these strain fields. And then when you reverse engineer that for Earth, it just fits perfectly and, and uh, it's fun. So thank you. Uh, Greg, to everyone, a lot of this makes sense to me. Thank you. It makes sense to me too. And uh, I just am sad that if you do choose to buy the book, it won't have this in there. <laughs> <laughs> because it's going to be on this on the next book. <laughs> but thank you, I appreciate that. Any other questions? I want to hear the, why are the periods of different names for the moon and the Earth? What the the period names? Oh 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 well. Well, I think it may have to do with the fact that. Most of the ages that we have here on Earth are absolute ages now, constrained by radiometric dating of volcanics, you know, of igneous rocks. Again, most of the the lunar work is is relative. We have absolute ages of of grab samples. What we need is outcrops. We need some good geologists to go up there and, and sample outcrops. <laughs> That's what we need. And um, I, I can't, I mean, I, I've spent a lot of time now reading a lot of lunar literature. <clears throat> from the most, from what I can tell, most of the samples that we've collected are grab samples and not outcrop samples. Um, but I, I, I really would hope that somebody could weigh in on that and let me know if I, I'm correct about that because I, I so. Yeah, one more I agree. Question. Okay. Okay. Uh, what, what we that? have what caused the lunar seismic ringing when the Apollo vehicle hit the moon? Um, well, if we go back and take a look at the uh, the seismic model for the moon right here, um, you can see the um, at the base of the crust. At around 30 kilometers, you get a pretty significant velocity increase, so an impedance contrast there. And you're going to get energetic reflections coming off of that at, at above 80 degrees. So you're going to get a ringing just from a resonance ringing just from the reflections associated with that. Um, 
the next phase boundary that you get is a 230 kilometers depth. And uh, I don't think that's that that may contribute to the ring as well. But, you know, honestly, I, I'm not sure about that, Bruce. Larry asked here about uh, flood basalts. Could they have been initiated by impacts? Absolutely. But when you read the literature, there are um, advocates uh, that are, are planetary geologists extraordinaire that say that large impacts don't cite crustal melting. But I think that's pretty much been decided that that's wrong. Um, I think that in the book, Punctuated Tectonic Equilibrium, I tie the um, Siberian traps to an impact in the Siberian Sea uh, associated with the largest mass extinction in history, the, the, the uh, Permatriassic uh, event. Mm. Um, so yes, I, I think that, that there's been a pairing of large bolide impacts large igneous provinces and large mass extinctions that occur with regularity about a three to five million year cycle uh, that's been demonstrated in the literature by Rampino and others. And, um, or is that a 30, I, I think that actually could be a 30 to 50 million year cycle, excuse me. Um, but yeah, the, the pairing of large igneous provinces and flood basalts with large impacts is something that I, I, I advocate absolutely. Um, because if you, if you think about it, uh, these large ener energetic events are the equivalent of storms flashing on Earth with long-reaching hydraulic consequences. <laughs> when these things hit, they have far-reaching uh, structural consequences and geophysical consequences. And on Earth, they have geodynamic consequences because we have active plate orogenesis, unlike Mars and the moon. So um, I hope I didn't inundate you with too much information tonight. And I hope I conveyed clearly what I was hoping to do. And I really appreciate, Jerry, the opportunity to do this because I'm nearing the completion of this work. I'll have the blog up on my website probably by the end of uh, or next month. <laughs> Um, so we've got a lot of spell checking to do, uh, but it's the first first will be the first manuscript for my next book, and I think it's like thirty five pages. So um, I look forward to sharing that. And uh, if you go onto my website now, you can download a, an abbreviated version of this this uh, presentation because I want to share it and I want to be able to have people um, add to it um, who who want to. And uh, hey. thank you. We have one final question here. Uh, somebody wants to know. Uh, New York Times this past Sunday has an article about space economy. Are you involved in any sort of thing with the moon? Uh, no, uh, but rest assured that um, since they have spectroscopy over the lunar surface and they know where the uh, um, elements of interest are that there are capitalists out there that are ready to take advantage of that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Undeniable. I mean, that's the next phase of, of, you know, exploration is, is mining, um, you know, extraterrestrial mining. Yep. And um, so that's, you know, same with Afghanistan. We, we flew Afghanistan with spectroscopy. So we understood where the mineral reserves before we went in there. Same thing. You know, so okay, yeah. All right, Dr. Greg Herman, we appreciate it. Uh, again, my mind is uh, going around in some circles here. Uh, you're always quite interesting, and uh, and I have actually I've been uh, ending my PowerPoint talks with a with a with a description of the uh, Chesapeake Bay impact and. Uh, that that may have more influence on in our geology than what we're giving it credit for. So since I heard you talk uh, 14 months ago here, you've changed my thinking around a little bit too. So, uh, yep. Well, thank you, Jerry. I appreciate that. I, I, uh, I think that that's going to be more and more apparent as we go forward. 
And uh, we just have to get over these prejudices we have about uh, uniformitarian viewpoints uh, right. and intersperse some of the catastrophism in there that uh, is lacking in today's uh, modern tectonic theory. Very well put. Great way to end. Okay, folks. Well, uh, this program, is, as uh, as uh, other ones have been, is, is uh, being recorded. It will be on jonesgeo.com in a matter of a couple of hours. If you want to go back and look at it again or invite friends to look at it, just go to jonesgeo.com and Zoom Rock Rooms. This was the 120th episode of the Zoom Rock Room since we started in April of 2020. So uh, uh, we'll see you back in about two weeks talking about Eurypterad fossils, and I'll let Melanie say the final word. Absolutely. Everybody take care, stay safe, stay warm, and we will see you next time. Okay, we'll see you, everybody.